Hello, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Dr. Harpreet Seth, the head of architecture at Heritwat University, Dubai. Before we start the session today, I would like to give a very quick introduction to the Heritwat University and the architecture program at the Heritwat University. So the Heritwat University is actually a public research university which is based in Edinburgh in Scotland and it was established in 1821 and the Dubai campus was established in 2005. The architecture program is actually in the Heritwat campus uh, which is in Dubai and it was established in 2015 and presently we've crossed uh, 100, and 100 students, architecture students and two of our uh, cohorts have already graduated. So we are a very young program, but a very ambitious program because uh, we're going ahead and we are already a uh, candidate course for REBA part one. And hopefully we will go through the uh, validation process, which is in May of this year. And I'm very happy to be welcoming uh, Sanjay today as he closes uh, the open series which was actually the OS architecture series, which was introduced uh, two years ago. And in this open series, uh, over the two semesters, we have six international speakers. The first year, the international speakers were coming to the campus, but now with the present situation that we face, we've been able to welcome international speakers from all over the world. And all of those who are, all of you who are listening to us, and all the students, young students, high school students, we would love you to join us because we accept students from all different curriculums. We have students from all different parts of the world. Our faculty members who specifically teach uh, on the D6 architecture program are also from all the different parts of the world. And if you are uh, wanting to know more, please go on to the Edit Ward website and you could become a part of the growing D6 community. So we call ourselves the D6 architecture. D6 is just a code within the university network. And I'm very happy to welcome all of you and uh, welcoming Sanjay for joining us today. Sanjay Buri has been a name to reckon with and uh, as I always say, we are a community of thinkers, makers and philosophers. I'm very happy to be welcoming Sanjay to this growing community. And uh, thank you, Sanjay, for joining us. And I would ha like to hand over to Cristiano to uh, introduce uh, Sanjay to all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Arpreet, for the introduction. And uh, we are delighted. We're delighted to have uh, Sanjay uh, with us. Uh, as a kind of a closing event of the open series uh, lectures. Um, I will introduce uh, Sanjay and then uh, I will move on and leave him uh, not really the stage, but the screen. Now we changed the way how we present um, uh, our uh, guests. And um, I would say that uh, Sanjay Puri graduated from the Academy of Architecture in Mumbai in 1988. Uh, in 1992, he founded Sanjay Puri Architects. The firm is uh, listed now among the top 100 architecture firms worldwide, uh, winning the World Architecture Festival Best Housing Project of the Year 2018 in Amsterdam. I remember that. I was there. Um, and the World's Best Residential Building in the Leaf Awards in London. The firm has won over 20, 250 awards, including 170 international award and 18 national awards. Now, I have to say that every time I contact Sanjay, I um, kind of commend and congratulate him for all the awards and I always get the wrong number. So I say, oh, congratulations for your under 50th award. And he say, no, it's 180. And it's keep growing. And uh, maybe uh, through the his presentation, we will find out uh, why his work is so highly recognized and so important as a contribution in, uh, in the architecture community. Sanjay strongly believes that every project should be designed contextually evolving spaces that are perceived in new ways. Each design takes cognizance of the climate, integrates sustainability in a cohesive way. The ideology is reflected in the extensive work done by the firm in three decades since its inception. He has been a speaker and a judge at numerous 
international architecture events like this one that we're having uh, this afternoon here. Um, so, uh, Sanjay, thank you so much for being with us. I leave the screen and the mic to you. Please uh, uh, start your presentation. Thank you so much. Yes, of course, uh, uh, while uh, Sanjay is preparing the presentation, I would like to mention that uh, maybe at the end of the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session. So uh, please write your uh, uh, question on the chat and uh, I will publish it and we can uh, uh, have some Q&A at the end of the presentation. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, We can hear you very good and we see the screen, so you can just uh, go. Hi, Cristiano. Thank you very, very much for inviting me here to share some of my projects and some of the ideas behind them. And I hope you're able to see the screen now. Yes, we can see the screen. Okay. So. Right, so. What I'm going to show you now is a cross section of projects. Yes. So this is the first project. It's called the Aria Hotel and it is located in So this is located in the wine growing region of India. It is the largest wine growing region within the country. It's a city which is a three hour drive from Mumbai. So this is the site. It's a very linear site and it has a contour difference of eight meters. So towards the rear on the south side, the land goes up into hills, which is a no development zone. And towards the north, it looks at this very, very large riverbed. Now looking at the contours, you know, you got this beautiful river view towards the north. So this is the way the entire building has been sited with this contour land. So what we've actually done is minimize the amount of land cutting and filling within the site, thereby making it more sustainable because not single shovel of mud has gone out of the site or come into the site for the entire building process. So at the lowest level, we have a large banquet hall which is entered directly from the main road which fronts the site on the northern side and which you have back of the house areas and then the restaurant bar and entrance lobby are located at a higher height where you drive up by ramp on the opposite side to enter the property the rooms occupy four levels and between the rooms, there is a courtyard space which is naturally lit and naturally ventilated. So what the project does is it literally generates almost 100% of the site in terms of open green spaces. When you calculate all of the green space that we left at different, different levels. So you have a large green space at the ground level itself where the banquet hall opens. Then the building gradually steps back with the lobby opening into a large terrace space. Then the rooms opening into a large space, which is called swimming pool. And then the internal yards and a smaller garden behind looking towards the 
this gives you a fair idea of how the building is enhanced with existing contours on the side, magically stepping back with natural ventilation also. And the entire roof has been used for solar panels as well as uh, open parking spaces with solar panels. And interestingly, the solar panels provide for 50% of the energy consumption of the hotel. This is the site plan, where on the right side, you drive up to the entrance lobby. And this is where one enters the hotel on the top. So you have lobby as well as the restaurant and the bar all opening out into this large terrace parking space, which puts the river on the northern side. And then, as you can see, the plan is a little fragmented, purposely done so that we stay away from the normal building typology which is used in hotels and everything is generally a large linear block or C-shaped block. Here, it is very organic in the way it is placed with these open courtyards in between, which provide natural light and ventilation to all the circulation spaces in the entire hotel. It's a typical flow plan. And each one of the rooms opens into large balcony spaces, which is at two and a half meters to three meters wide, overlooking the river or the hill from the south. That's a terrace plan with the extensive solar panels that we've used. As well, you can see on the western side a linear line of open parking, which has a sheltered roof, which also has solar panels. That's a detail section through the outer. And this is a longitudinal section. These are the typical rooms. Now, what we've done here is again staying away from the typical hill typology. Each floor is designed like a series of linear cuboids, which are angled differently at each floor, allowing the building to look very sculptural and at the same time giving slightly different views to each one of the rooms within the hotel. These are photographs of the naturally ventilated and naturally lit atrium spaces, which all the corridors flank, and all of these are non air conditioned spaces. This is the building with. 50% of its walls are built out of the local black basalt stone that is available within this region. So the entire lower level comprising the banquet, restaurant, the bar and the lobby are all built in this local basalt stone and then concrete frames create the rooms on top. So that's the view from the terrace of the restaurant looking up towards the This is the entry point at the higher level, which is plus six meters from the lower point where the banquet is entered. So it's a completely different entrance for the main hotel. This serves two functions that whenever there is large uh, banquet gathering, it does not disturb the hotel in any way in terms of sound or in terms of the people crossing over, as is the case in most other hotels. That's again a view from the large deck that fronts the restaurant and the bar with a shallow water trough towards the end. So this is the pool level and the pool is designed with this infinity edge that allows it to merge with the river when you walk out to the pool. And this is uh, the interesting juxtaposition of each level of rooms which is angled differently as one is looking up to the hotel. So the building rather than appear like a single block which has fenestration appears like a series of stacked volumes one over the other. All of these are cantilevered balconies going up to a maximum of 3.6 meters. That's the atrium, which is naturally lit and naturally ventilated, open corridors flanking it. 
and this is the other side atrium. So each atrium also has its own look. So the idea was to give a different feeling and a different sense of identity to each part of the hotel. There is no repetition in this hotel. Whichever way you look at it, whether you look at it from the inside or the outside or what the experience is within the rooms or within each one of its public spaces. These are the large, relatively very simple rooms opening out into large decks overlooking the river. This is when one is within the deck looking out towards a pool at the various landscape decks which step down and the river across. So these are some of the factors of sustainability that were built in. Like I said before, there was no land cutting at all within this entire site. No soil came from outside, no soil was taken off this site. And more than 50% of the spaces are naturally lit and naturally ventilated. The entire water is recycled and reused for gardening as well as And 50% of the structure is built with the local black salt stone. So it's a very small 60 room hotel, but it has a very, very distinct identity and it was designed based on what site was, what its orientation is, which way the best views are, capitalizing on natural ventilation and natural light and natural resources. This is the second project. This is an office building located in Chennai in India, which is in South India and has amongst the metro cities of India, one of the most hot climates with temperatures in excess of 35 degrees for eight months of the year. So our site is located on an arterial road, on road in the heart of the main Chennai city. And unlike most sites, it has a very narrow entry point, which is only nine meters wide. You enter the site to a nine meter entry point, and then the site widens up towards the center. And it is surrounded by old existing buildings, which vary from three to six stories. So this is an overview of the site, where you can see the small mouth towards the main entrance and then how it is sandwiched between these existing building land sites. So what we've done here is tilted the building slightly so that when one drives in or walks into this building from the main road, you see more of the frontage of the building than you would have had it been parallel to what the site boundary was. And by doing this, what also happens is that each one of the office blocks is located towards the north. This is very, very pertinent in Chennai city because of the high temperatures south. And if you look carefully, the service cores, which are all colored in red, are taken towards the south of the site. So this literally acts like a whole double layer, reducing the heat in into the building by as much as 50 percent. So everything from the AHU to the service staircases to the elevator and red blocks are all towards the southern side, leaving the north completely open, opening into small landscape terraces, which are linear at each of the floor. Ground floor accommodates the cafe and conference room, and these are the facilities for the entire room. So this is the cross section explaining how the building sits within its small site. It's got parking basements and it's also got vertical stack parking behind because there was a high restriction on this plot. So you literally, uh, you cannot build anything higher than this. And it was a challenge, in fact, to consume the kind of built-up area that this plot had, which is to a factor of 2.5 times This is again an overview showing how this building sits within all the adjoining buildings on all sides. That's the ground floor. You can see how the building is tilted so that it allows 
more of the front page to be visible when one drives in and it creates a more open space at the entry point allowing vehicle traffic to easily go through this very very tight plot that's the typical flow we can see the service core taking the entire southern boundary and all the offices oriented towards them, opening into linear landscape terraces so unlike terrace buildings which just keep stepping back here, the plinth has been taken deliberately to allow more open space at the ground level for ease of circulation and creating open space at the public. After which, the building gradually steps out and then finally starts stepping backwards. And on the rooftop, to compensate for the less amount of green space that we have. Side into this the entire terrace is landscape, and then it solar panels with the service cores. So that's a cross section through the building, and this is a longitudinal section through the building showing the double layered basement at the bottom, and then the office levels on top. It has all been done in flat slab construction. Allowing it to be cantilevered by three meters to six meters at each floor. This is the building as one approaches it from the entrance, and if the tilt is very clear in this, you can see how road levels small. Then the building gradually steps out, and then it starts stepping back. Linear terraces outside each office, which are all north oriented. And now this building has been in operation for almost a year. Air conditioning requirement of the building is 30% less compared to the normal kind of office building that one is one would have created in from this area. And several of those examples exist where people have taken you no know, cognizance of what the climate is, simply passing through structures all through. That's the building in the evening. So the east and west, which also get a lot of heat, have been punctured with very, very small openings that allow natural light to come in, but at the same time, it is shielded from heat gain. This is a detailed view of the building showing how it gradually gently was out. That's back inside. These are linear balconies which are two meters wide running across the length of the office, allowing every office space to actually walk out into these open terraces at every floor. That's again a close up of the building that shows how it can cleave us in and out at every floor. So, again, rather than making simple linear or rectilinear block. This building is rendered sculptural by the way it actually can be resolved and then steps back. And this is done with a functional requirement of trying to create open spaces for each office, unlike most office buildings, which do not open into any kind of open space except at the ground level. That's a detailed view. And this is the building looking back towards the main entry on the eastern side. That's the east side. And that's a close up of the eastern side. So these are the kind of linear balconies that one steps out into out of, out of outside each office. These are the sustainable factors which I touched upon earlier, where uh, one has generated open space at every level, although it is very small, and then made up for it by doing creating a landscape terrace. And solar energy here, we had a limited amount of space to create solar energy panels, unlike the Aria Hotel, where 50% of the, heat, the energy requirement is supplemented by solar panels. In this case, 15% of what this building consumes is 
can be hit by the solar panels in the building. All the water here as well is recycled and reused. So this was the small building which is about 85,000 square feet located in Chennai in India called the Akshay 27. This third project is a school that we completed early last year. It's in Rajasthan, which is uh, on the western side of India and it has a desert climate. So this is the overall location of the site. This actually we've designed the entire township which you see on the right hand side. So it's a hundred acre township. The entire township which has a contour difference of 16 meters has been designed without any soil coming in or going out of the site. In fact, here the amount of sustainable practices and methods that we use actually make this whole township self-sufficient in two cents. So this township was created for the workers and the officials working in the cement plant which is close by. So it is a very specific requirement. And the entire population, which is now 3,000 people living here, the full energy consumption of this entire town is by the residual energy which is generated by the cement plant. So there is actually no electricity being taken from the outside, from any external source. All the energy for all the housing, the bungalows, the house, the hostels, the bachelor studio and the school, which comprises the township, generated from the cement plant from its residual energy. In addition, there is forest recycling, there is rainwater harvesting, all of the water is reused in this township, used fly ash bricks made from the residual cement fly ash, which is generated again in the cement plant. And in addition, it is 100% naturally ventilated throughout in every kind of building. So, we are here only talking about this particular school that was built in the southwest corner of the site. The site is about two and a half acres and it has been purposely kept towards the corner which has direct public access so that this school not only provides education for the people living within this township, it is also open to the nearby villages and children from those nearby villages for their education. Now, when we had to design the school, we looked at the traditional Indian courtyard, which has governed traditional planning for many centuries. And this courtyard model is very successful in India because it allows the internal spaces to be during the hot summer months. And in this case, that is very, very being in Rajasthan with 40 degrees Celsius for eight months of the year. But what we've done is taken that courtyard and then looked at it in a totally different way and fragmented it. And other than a completely enclosed courtyard, we can open it towards the east and west. facilitated complete cross ventilation in the courtyard and broken the school up into two distinct volumes, one on the northern side and one on the southern side. But the orientation of every single classroom and activity space in the school is towards the north so that there is less heat gain into the building. So this is the fragmentation of the school. What you see in beige color are the classroom blocks which are all oriented towards the north. And then the large volume which is gray is actually the auditorium which does not require ventilation that has purposely been kept towards the south so that there is no heat gain from the south. The other clay blocks are the vertical circulation spaces and the toilet block. So that's the detail of the entire school. So this entire open courtyard space is sheltered with a very interesting series of what we call pergolas. Yeah, thin RCC beams, which create a very interesting light and shadow throughout. So this is the ground floor plan. One enters the school from 
the eastern side and the auditorium is both very close to the entrance so that this auditorium can be used for public performances even when the school is shut so that it doubles up as an entertainment space and a public activity space for the entire 100 acre township where there are 3000 families living 12 and 13 are the classrooms the southern side comprises of the primary school and then 10 is the open courtyard space that creates several pathways linking the southern part of the school to the northern part of the school so one has a choice of where one actually walks across from unlike most cases where there is a single circulation spine here you have multiple options of where you could walk across from that's the first floor. It's a very low level school. It is only ground school. That's the second floor. And this is a longitudinal section giving on a, an idea of the scale of spaces and how they interconnect. So this kind of explains it in a very interesting way where the auditorium block is the large block on the southern side and the classrooms are all on the northern side in addition to orienting them towards the north we also wanted that there should be eastern or western sun hitting the classroom was directly for this reason there are these large vertical screen walls that have been projected beyond the classroom and in addition there are vertical fins between the windows so this completely cuts off any kind of light from the eastern or western side which is very harsh in Rajasthan, orienting every classroom directly towards the north. So you don't need any curtains or blinds, and you have indirect natural light throughout the day in all the classrooms. This is the central atrium play space that connects the northern part and the southern part of the school which is escaped in portions and paved in portions. And this has become the focus point of the school. Because the children love the space and use it in a number of ways in all their free time. So it was very interesting to go back to the school and see how children are using the space in so many different ways. The color chosen is particularly been done. It's terracotta, which is a deep red. And this color changes at all points of the day. So if you go back, and you, this was earlier in the day, this is later. So, the same color keeps changing its hues throughout, depending upon how much sunlight hits it from which direction. And similarly, the shadow pattern is also constantly changing throughout the day. So, it kind of makes it a very dynamic, connected space, which doubles up as a play space and an activity space. So this is the internal part of the school where the texts are all open and there are screen walls created out of fly ash brick which facilitate natural ventilation throughout the day. And there is no air conditioning used and it's not even required because we when we went to the last of the school it was in the summer months and it was absolutely cool when you walk into the school in location of the school so these are all the internal spaces each floor has a different color so that there's a clear identity as to which classrooms you're in and it also avoids repetition so this is the entry point to the school so the face where the entire building is seen as a series of sculptural screen walls which are actually blocking all the southern gate from entering the school. Simultaneously making it very, very sculptural in the way it is perceived. This is the northern side. The northern side opened into a very large playground space of six acres, which has a complete athletic track as well as a football ground that doubles as a cricket field. So here you can see the details of the vertical walls that screen 
its classroom from the east and west as well as the vertical fins that further screen the windows. This is the western side. That's the east side. So this was a school done in a very, very low budget. It was very economical. And more importantly, the running of the school is very, very economical because of the less, you know, the very, very less amount of energy that is required to run the school. So all these factors contribute to the sustainability design. The school was a very, very satisfying project. And this brings me to the last project. This was a house that we finished two years ago in a city called Lucknow in India. So this is the site. The building sits on a very arterial road and it is surrounded by hundreds of houses which are ground plus one or ground plus two. So in this particular case, the client bought four small plots together and amalgamated them as one. So we actually have a very rare site where there are, it's like an island with roads on all four sides. Now, normally in a location like this, one would have expected that the main orientation of the house is towards this large wide road, but we've actually done the total opposite. Because this arterial road is on the southern side of the site. So not only is it the southern side from where there is a lot of heat generated, so becomes the southern side also becomes a very, very strong position for the vehicular pollution that is created from the south. So this would have been the ideal case, and this is what the client was expecting us to do. Building the house towards the rear of the park and keeping the front space open, but this front space would have been on the southern side, which is only. And that's the side which gets a lot of heat in the extensive some of that Lucknow has. So to combat this, what we've done is actually take the entire building footprint towards the south and generate a large amount of open space on the northern side. Painting all the main rooms. Now, this is the traditional punctured rectilinear courtyard space that a lot of traditional houses in India have. But what we've done is kept the courtyard but actually fragmented the spaces all around it, generating you know, spaces for the wind to actually flow through the house at every level and simultaneously creating multiple small landscape interstitial spaces in between all these living spaces at every level. So it's a ground plus one structure which has this large courtyard in the center and it has smaller gardens interspersed. And then it steps back from the north, creating non facing balconies for the room. So, as well as shielded terraces in between the spaces on the corner. And then because Lucknow has a lot of heat and a very extensive summer, we've used a GRC screen, which is designed in the form of voids, which actually protect this house from the east, west, as well as the southern side. So it allows complete natural ventilation as well as natural light, but at the same time, it reduces heat gain by about 30% and shields the building from the extensive noise from the arterial. So this is a floor plan. We 
you can see the large courtyard punctuating the center of the house and then smaller artificial gardens punctuating in different locations and the shielded screen spaces outside of each room that's the first floor plan see the number of small green spaces that are generated within the plan at the first level the living room is two floors high and the courtyard the center is three floors high with natural ventilation on the top and the solar panels on top of the living room as well as on top of the topmost terrace over the courtyard space So this is the longitudinal section through the house on the south axis. And this is the horizontal section. So this is the house as one sees it from the road on the southeast corner. So each one of these screen volumes is actually has a landscape space within it. So the house is seen as this composition of two different kinds of concrete as well as the GRC screens. Very interesting composition that changes at every single angle, every single point of view of this house. The same space is seen very interestingly within. This is the larger garden space that is generated on the northern side. And this is the protected side of the house. So this garden is only overlooked by houses on the other sides. If one had to have this garden on the southern side, it could have had a lot of traffic noise. And with this house being built now and used since two years, this garden becomes a very quiet place, solace within the house. This is the western side. So at every point, you see this very interesting composition that is constantly changing with these kind of spaces that have been created for the house within it. So this is the family room that opens out into this screened volume, which faces the south. So the heat is completely cut off, and at the same time, you get this very interesting light and shadow pattern, which is constantly changing. This is one of the bedrooms at the lower level, which opens to this large protected deck space which is outdoors and these are the kind of interstitial spaces where uh, the kitchen and the bathroom space so every space within has a large amount of glass looking plants and then the screen wall outside which provides privacy this is a large courtyard that punctuates the house in the center with Natural ventilation on all four sides and skylights on the top. This is the exact point where one enters this house, where you see this series of open, semi open, and spaces with light falling in very interesting different patterns uh, of the house. That's the living room, room volume, which is two floors high, flanked by the dining, which is a single level. And the dining space of the garden on the northern side. And this is where the central courtyard space actually walks up towards the main garden on the northern side. It's a house of many, many you know, different experiences within the house. So this brings me to an end of this presentation for uh, four projects, a small 60 room hotel, a medium sized office building, a school and house which was 8,000 square feet. Thank you very much for your attention and your time. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Sanjay, for being uh, so clear. The presentation we experienced some lag in the, uh, you know, in the the voice in your voice, but uh, 
I think that was uh, compensated by the clarity of the drawings and the clarity of the process of the presentation. Um, we uh, got more than almost 40 questions <laughs> that I will keep you here until tomorrow, Sanjay. I hope you, you didn't take any commitment. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but uh, I'll try okay. to summarize them. Uh, there is one that is keep uh, coming in uh, different forms, of course. Uh, okay. And, uh, you know, I, I was listening to this uh, presentation by uh, RCR Architectos, who were uh, recently nominated in the Pritzker Prize, the Spanish group of architects that were describing their uh, way of approaching projects, uh, starting obviously from the brief and then moving into the uh, location, to the site, and from there moving into the concept, which I definitely find that in all your uh, presentation of projects and that this last part of uh, this process, uh, it uh, seems to be um, one of the topic that was that uh, our audience is more is interested in, into it. Um, and everyone is asking, how do you get the concept? Where the concept come from? You know, how do you react? Is there a personal way to react to um, the, the specific conditions, uh, of course, of the brief uh, and the request of the clients, but uh, also uh, from this um, peculiarity of certain sites and so on? How the concept is formed in the design process? Okay, so. Okay, so it's like this that you know you have to take cognizance of a number of factors. One, there is of course the functional requirement of the typology of the building, which a lot of clients do not understand in totality. So the client will only give you their requirements that for example, if it's a hotel, I want so many rooms. So that is one aspect of it, but you have to take those requirements and then you have to see what a building typology that actually requires in terms of its functions. Then you look at the site, the context of the site, you find a modules that are available in that particular site. How should you orient that building? These factors and then look at what has been done in the past, that kind of typology. How have tackled a school in desert, for example, or how people have addressed a hotel in that kind of location. And then do something that is unique, which does not take anything that has been done before. It looks at a problem in a new way. But it's same at the same time, it simultaneously resolves the functions, addressing the context, creating something that is sustainable, and yet something that is absolutely new to experience in every respect. Whether you look at the building from outside, how you approach the building, what you see when you walk in, what is the interrelation of space within the site, what is the spatial relationship between different spaces building so all of these factors okay um okay uh well there are some general questions and there are some more specific ones i'll try to cover um, most of them kind of as i said uh, creating sort of big families of question but um um, there is a one question that I, I, I'm also interested in because it seems that your research uh, is uh, extremely, as I said, uh, very pragmatic, which I uh, absolutely appreciate uh, for my part. But also I like to, um, there is someone that asked an interesting question, who do you look forward to for inspiration as an architect? I mean, do you have any model uh, role or somebody, some specific uh, architects, maybe in the past that you've been studying and you were more interested in their work and uh, how this uh, precedence uh, influenced uh, your uh, your practice. 
So it's like this that you can't look at one particular aspect of anything, but it is, is in the sense you cannot look at one person's general body of work or inspiration. It is certain buildings have always inspired. So whether it was uh, the Gaganai Museum in Bilbao and the way spaces were abstracted with it, or the Daniel Lipskin design Jewish Museum in Berlin, which was so radically different from anything that had been done before at its time, or the Kuf Himmelblau designed uh, cinema halls in Dresden, which is a very unknown building of theirs as compared to some of their more you know, extensively featured buildings like the PMW. So there are a number of these buildings that have gone and experienced, and you know, it has kind of stayed as to how somebody has so uniquely designed a space, taking cognizance of what the functions are, but at the same time, just reinterpreting spatial dynamics in a totally different way. So that is that, that's, you know, one aspect of it, that certain things expire, but then there are also certain things that exist for you. For example, there was this uh, one hotel that I visited called the Amman in Montenegro which is located in a small island, you know, it doesn't have any vehicle access. You have to walk into with, you have to walk into with a pathway and then it's in the middle of the sea. And it is actually a 600 year old village. And what the hotel people have done is they've retained all the existing structures and only done interior intervention. And the beautiful kind of organic spaces that that village has is just amazing. Because there are so many different ways to get from your home to the restaurant that you can actually take a different path each time. And when you experience something like that, that stays in your head for a long time, that, you know, organic nature, which allows you to explore the spaces differently each time, should be something that is integrated with your design. You know, there shouldn't be one particular path that you take in a building or there should not be one particular path that you're forced to take within your house. Why can't you have three different ways from one place to the other? And so these are some of those aspects that then when you when you experience them, they influence your thought process. And then it kind of comes in in a kind of subconscious way within what you plan. So that is one of those aspects. There was a time where uh, I was just driving and there was a truck in front and it was carrying steel pipes. And those steel pipes had moved due to the movement. So the steel pipes that are actually of one size had actually moved back and forth like this. And looking at those pipes, I was thinking, wow, you know, this, this could have been a sculpture. That was my thought then. But eventually that thought translated into the design of Dakshay 27 building where you see these tracks that move. You know? So you know, sometimes it's just the veins that you see in a leaf that could influence your design. So there are these number of things that influence your design. It could be art that you saw somewhere. It could be, uh, you know, the way the lighting transform fashion show stage. It's just, I'm just talking about the patterns of light created on a screen, you know, and that kind of stays in your head and then or subconsciously, if subconsciously in some way in what you're designing eventually. So there are so many different factors that contribute towards design that at the end, finally, or where that thought came. But what I'm trying to say here is that there are so many, so many, so many different aspects. So I have something to say to people who are following, who are watching this is that you need to open yourself to experience many multiple different thoughts and design processes, not just in buildings, but in nature, in the way you know, light falls, in the way villages and old cities are planned. All of these give a lot of cues to the way one can You know, if you ever walk through an old city, there is no road that goes straight. So why go all the modern town planning go straight? Because straight is the most boring way to experience something because you see what is at the end. And those organic 
straight don't allow you to see what is at the end. So you go to a point, then there is an opening, and then your you know, vision turns, then you look somewhere else, and then there's something that is more interesting. So it's this constant change that keeps happening in the older towns, in the older cities. Even in uh, Montenegro, I went to two of these old cities. One was called Ar, one was called Dudwa, and there was another one called uh, I forgot the name, Kotor, Kotor. So for these old cities, it's amazing. They are pedestrian and the buildings happen in a kind of haphazard way. That's what is interesting. Even Venice is interesting. So all these organic cities, I think, have a lot of cues that one should take in design so that one doesn't make something that is purely geometric and uh, pretty easily discernible. You know, one should create organic spaces in whatever one does to make it more interesting, to make it more uh, more different in the way it is perceived. Well, I guess uh, you share. Um, I had uh, the, the vision of a, a former professor of mine, very old one, a long time ago, when he was talking about what is called the, the light obsession of an architect. Right? When, uh, whenever we go, if we're passionate about what we do, we identify reasons to understand, to interpret, to imagine architecture in anything more or less we see. And I think that's probably, um, I, I think from your words, I can understand that you actually share this vision. And uh, that it's very fascinating how we can take uh, uh, ideas and inspiration from all these different aspects that makes this uh, profession so interesting uh, based on the, on, the, on the very high curiosity that we want to portray in, uh, in our uh, practice. Um, I'm going to move on a little bit into something more specific. There are some questions about the use of materiality. There are lots of, in all the projects that we saw, uh, concrete, for instance, was uh, always present. And uh, I will kind of uh, um, add something, um, I'm here and there picking up on, on some uh, questions that I find. Um, what about materials and context, for instance? I myself also designed some buildings in India when I used to be a professional architect. And I remember that the craftsmanship is a, a very important factor of that context. It's not only the environment, uh, the climate, uh, the social kind of cultural condition, but also how people do build uh, buildings and that, that kind of comes into the design process. How do you address this uh, condition? Uh, what is the choice of materiality? What concrete gives you that maybe other con the other materials don't? OK, so it's like this, you know. So there are materials available in some sites and there are some materials available in some sites. So that very first project that I showed called the Aria Hotel, that black basalt stone is available in Nasik. So it was extensively used for 50% of the walls of the structure. And of course, when one goes higher, then one can't use stone. So all the lower levels are in stone and the higher levels only are. When you're planning within a city, then there is very little that is available in terms of regional material. But we are now doing very interesting house in Jodhpur, which is in Rajasthan, where we are building the entire house. And it's a large house, it's a 36,000 square feet house, completely being built in the local Jodhpur stone. So we've actually got artisans who have been used to creating these walls and stone since many centuries, the same families. And we are making screens out of stone and all the walls out of stone. Then in another case, we are doing a project in Kesselmeyer where we are, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, but we are finally going to get a chance to do it because we've convinced the client to do a construction. But that again you can do because the entire structure is only ground floor because you can't on ground on this one. So it also depends upon the client A because every client is not open to using materials that are available there. And B is that the design should allow you to use those materials. You know, sometimes if you if you're doing like a developer related project like one called Share in Chennai. Now that was a multi-storied building situated in the heart of the city. So you actually 
basically don't have much choice in terms of details. You have to rely on concrete. But in these other cases, we are experimenting now adobe construction, like I said, with real stone walls all throughout with bamboo. In another project where we're doing it is sort entirely out of bamboo. So we're using all these materials now. Okay, I see. Um, okay, so I'm, I think that uh, I'm not quite sure who the audience uh, is, but I believe that there are many, many young architects, many young students that uh, uh, do admire you. I mean, the, the, they're all very happy about the presentation and they're all asking um, how to become so successful in terms of uh, uh, a relationship uh, with the client, for instance, uh, the way how to run a firm. And uh, I will kind of um, change this question and put it more in a, a timeline, thinking your practice um, has been working for 30 years, right? Three decades. How did it change throughout this time? How did you change? doing architecture how did you uh, how did you grow throughout this process are you a different architect from the beginning okay so there was this huge amount of changes that we went through so everybody keeps asking you know questions about success not success i don't know what is the measure of success but there was when we started i started actually with a very large commercial developers project so it was a very large project to start with and you know it, it, it gave me a lot of insight it was a 54 acre township with 3000 apartments and a school and a club so it was a huge project to start with but at the same time it was a commercially driven project where there was a very tight degree of the number of one bedroom apartments two bedroom apartments bedroom apartments sizes cost cost effective, so all of that. So I actually, because I started my career with a developer, we got a very large number of developer projects. And see, those are projects that are commercially driven. There is not that much of creativity that one can do with them, other than creating interesting open layout and cross ventilated spaces, because uh, these developers don't want to spend anything extra for design, design, you know, and they more than that, they don't understand that good design actually makes good business. So a huge amount of arguments we've had, and there is the huge amount of, uh, you know, transition from doing these developer driven projects towards doing projects that are more artistic in nature, and more design sense in nature. So it, it was a very long process and it really took long. It was, I think we spent uh, the first decade or so in a lot of commercial architects, which essentially apartment buildings and office buildings, largely in Mumbai, where the creativity is very, very limited. And then simultaneously, when you start you know, I have something to say here that for all you young architects who listen to this, it is really important that you travel post post this pandemic. You need to travel, you need to experience buildings in reality and not look at it in Instagram or perhaps it is important to actually physically be in that space to understand what architecture in terms of the perception of spaces. Also, it is very important to attend world architecture events like Venice Biennale and the World Architecture Festival, where there is a cross section of speakers, of presentations, of different kinds of projects from all across the world. Because all of that, when you see, it opens your mind towards what you know is being done in different parts of the world, why it is being done. And it is only then that you understand that actually has to be a reason what you do. You don't just draw that line because somebody asked you to. And I am saying now that 
when we started, we did draw those lines. We are developers told us to draw those lines. That is not the correct thing to do. So then one has to understand the importance of that. And it took us that little while to understand the importance of what was actually taught in the very first year of architecture. You know, it was the, one of the first lessons by a professor in college where he said, think before you do that. But the understanding of what he said in, in the first year came much later. But then that's the most important thing. You really need to reason what you're doing and not just blindly follow a design done somewhere by somebody else or not just blindly follow what the client is asking you to do. It takes longer, it takes a lot of argument, but you have to believe in what you're doing and why you're doing it. And if you believe in why you're doing it, only then can you convince the person on the other side of the table that why you use for that line. And that it makes good sense for them that way. And when you do that, then that is success. It's not about how much you do. It's not about uh, how many projects you have. It's about doing what you want to do, which is the correct thing. Convince the other person on the other side that that is the correct thing. And doing it that way. That is success. Whether the project is one or whether the project is 10 or whether the project is 100. OK, that's very clear. I think uh, the time is uh, finished, unfortunately, for the questions, uh, although uh, we had, uh, I think, 84 questions, uh, Sanjay. 84? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> some of them were similar. I had to kind of choose, uh, and I give it back to our director, Harpreet, uh, that will conclude uh, this session. For my side, is all. Thank you, Sanjay, for being so kind and available. Uh, we really enjoy your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. Been. Thank you very much, Cristiano. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sanjay. And I think uh, this has been by far over the last two years, uh, our most well attended open series. And uh, what an absolutely phenomenal manner to be able to close the open series with. So thank you very much and uh, absolutely very, very engaging, very absorbing presentation. And I think it is reflected uh, by the number of questions we've had. And when I was going through the questions, uh, I could imagine that it is actually from a huge range, maybe from students to professionals. And I think it is all about igniting that fire within each student or young professionals, you know, who are heading on this uh, path of taking architecture as a full time profession. Actually, architecture is not only a profession, it is probably a way of life. And I think you exhibited that so very well uh, in the projects that you shared with the students and all of us. Thank you all of you for attending today's open series as we close the uh, uh, open series. Uh, for this year and we hope to see you in the next academic year when we again will have a set of uh, three open series in the first semester and then it is followed by another three set of international uh, speakers coming for the open series. So thank you everyone in Dubai. I know we have people joining us from all over the world, but those of us who are in Dubai are going to have a weekend. So this is our last working day. Enjoy your weekend. And if you want to get in touch with us, we will put the link to our Instagram account and our architecture page, which is on the Heritage Ward website. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christiano. Thank you, Chris. No, thank you, Christiano. Thank you, Samir. Thank you, all of you. Thank you very, very much. Great. Okay. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you.